right. Praise the Lord, everyone. The Lord. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. We're happy to be in the house of the Lord again on a Wednesday evening. We certainly praise God for each and every one of you being here with us. This truly is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice. We do rejoice. We are rejoicing. We shall rejoice and be glad in it no matter what is happening uh, in your life, no matter what is happening in my life. Uh, that we have the command to rejoice. And uh, this is the, um, the attitude of the Christian that has made Jesus their personal satisfaction. And of course, when you're satisfied with Jesus, you, you just don't need anything else. When you're satisfied with Jesus, you don't need anybody else. And so we bless God tonight for being satisfied with him we thank and praise God for his presence and his power uh, being here with us in our Bible study on tonight. And we uh, hope and pray that you have had a, uh, a blessed time uh, in your uh, personal consecration uh, as we are all taking the time to uh, draw ourselves closer to God. Uh, he said in the book of James, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Uh, it is an impossibility to set out to get close to God uh, and not have God get close to you. In fact, the closer you become to him, the closer he becomes to you. The further you drift from him, uh, he stays in the same place because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age, even until the end of the world. Uh, he'll never leave us, but that doesn't mean that we can't leave him. Uh, and so we thank the Lord. The closer you get to him, uh, the more you ensure that you will never leave him. And uh, we get close to God through our personal consecration, close to him through fasting, close to him through prayer, through Bible reading, Bible study, church attendance, fellowship with God's people. All of these things uh, help us to get close to him. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more uh, of him you see. The more revelation you get, the more of him, his word, his will, and his way you understand. And so closeness with God is the pursuit and should be the pursuit of every believer. And so uh, you're here tonight because you want to be close to him. Amen. You're watching this live stream because you want to be close to him, and it is a wonderful thing. We're not going to belabor the hour. Of course, we are in uh, the final installment of this series on uh, the uh, Let Us Go On Into Perfection. This is our final lesson. Uh, we, I think we have made the point uh, over and over and over again uh, in terms of what God's plan and what his will is and his desire for us uh, as Christians uh, to progress and go on to full spiritual maturity. And so we're going to get into the word of the Lord. We uh, have, I believe, uh, just until eight o'clock. And I believe that is more than sufficient for us to cover the material uh, that we have to cover tonight. And so let us bow our heads in a brief moment of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you right now, Lord, for your goodness, your loving kindness, your tender mercies, oh God, that you have extended unto all of us. Without you, Father, we are nothing. Without you, O oh Lord, our lives are worthless, empty, and meaningless. Without you, O oh God, we would fail. But we thank you right now, Lord Jesus, that you are real to us, that your word is real, your power is real, your presence is real, your spirit is real, your anointing is real. And we don't take it for granted, nor do we take it lightly, that you have put it in our hearts and our minds and our spirits to be in this Bible study tonight whether we're here in person or whether we, whether we are watching online, you have put the heart, the desire for us to seek you, to seek your word and to seek your will and to seek your ways. And so, Lord Jesus, we are here offering you our hearts that you may write your laws in, upon our hearts and that you may put them upon the tables of our minds. Help us tonight, God, through your word, minister to us, inspire us encourage us and uplift us in the mighty name of jesus christ break every yoke and break every fetter tonight through the power of your word set someone free in the name of jesus if there be any unsaved in our audience tonight we pray that you would inspire them to make a change that you would compel them toward you that you may save their lives forever and this is our prayer this is our request O oh god we believe by faith that you will do it 
Oh, Lord, because your word said that you would, we'll give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us clap our hands and say amen. Amen, amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. If you're watching on Facebook, we certainly do uh, invite you to share this broadcast. Uh, I believe that it will be a blessing to you as we all are striving to go on to perfection. This is what our subject is tonight. Uh, the last installment of this lesson, this series, let us go on to perfection. Let us go to our root scripture, which is in Hebrews chapter number six and verses number one through three book of Hebrews chapter number six and verses number one through three and as it is our custom we will read these verses together aloud in unison uh, as we get the sense of what the word of the Lord is saying unto us All right, Hebrews chapter number six, verses number one through three. If we have it, can we say amen? God bless you in Jesus' name. Let us read these verses aloud together in unison. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and our faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now, this is our subject. Let us go on unto perfection. And uh, of course, going on unto perfection simply means that you're going on to full spiritual maturity. And the only way that an individual, that the child of God can go on to full spiritual maturity is that they first must come into the knowledge of the basic fundamental truths of God's word, which is found in, within these six principles. The apprentice from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. These principles are the basic fundamental truths of the word of God. Repentance is a basic. What is repentance? Repentance means to turn away from sin, to turn away from all wrongdoing. Uh, dead works, dead works, not only sin, but contextually is also referring to those works of the law that had no eternal or salvific value, keeping feast days uh, and all of those things that uh, were mandated to them under the Old Testament law. In the New Testament, those works are null and void. They were nullified when Jesus nailed them to the cross. The scripture says in the book of Colossians, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances which were against us. And so dead works, not just sin, but any unfruitful work that does not produce or any work that does not produce salvation has no salvific impact, salvific effect. Uh, he calls them dead works and we are to to turn from them. Uh, repentance, again, is a basic. It simply means to turn, to change, to have a change of heart and a change of mind or a change of will. That's what repentance is. That's a basic fundamental truth of the word of God. Faith toward God. Faith, what you believe about God. Having faith in God is one thing and having faith toward God is another thing. Faith in God is the expression of the fact that you believe that God exists. Faith toward God is a little bit deeper. It says that I expect something from the God that I believe in. And what can you expect uh, from God when you repent of your sins? What can you expect? You can expect the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For this is how all of us receive the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We repented of our sins, and we had faith toward God. We gave him our faith, knowing that he would, and believing that he would give us the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and this is what he did. This is a basic, fundamental truth of the Word of God. Doctrine of baptisms. That is, uh, the teaching of baptisms throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament. There were types of baptism, uh, types of New Testament baptism. 
Uh, the, the flood in Noah's day was a type of baptism. Uh, Moses and the children of Israel passing through the Red Sea, cloud hovering above them, the Spirit of God in the form of a cloud was a type of spirit baptism and water baptism. The divers washings of the priests, types of baptism. All of those things that happened in the Old Testament that were foreshadowing uh, events and types, shadows and patterns of New Testament baptism, which would be installed by none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, would be practiced by the apostles throughout the fourteen or the twenty-one uh, New Testament epistles, and of course continued on by the Apostolic Church today. That is water baptism in the name of Jesus. The reason why this is a basic fundamental truth of the word of God is because many people today teach that baptism is not necessary for salvation. They say that all you need to do is uh, say the sinner's prayer and that you are saved. Well, uh, you'd have to find someone in the Bible. You'd have to find someone in the New Testament that was saved by saying the sinner's prayer. You'd have to find for me any uh, just one scripture where the apostles after preaching the gospel uh, commanded the people to repeat after me or commanded the people to say this Lord Jesus I am a sinner and so forth and so on uh, you won't find it there because that's not how salvation is received in the life of an individual you will see a pattern of consistency throughout the book of Acts, which contains the first 30 years of the New Testament church, that the apostles commanded their listeners, their audience, anytime they preached the gospel, they commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a pattern of consistency. They don't break the consistency. They never one time tell an individual that uh, just repeat after me. They commanded them to be baptized. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Peter commanded them to be baptized. Uh, Acts, chapter, uh, uh, Acts chapter 8, uh, Philip went down, baptized the Samaritans in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 10, Peter preached to the Gentiles. God poured out the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He commanded them to be baptized. Acts chapter number 19, uh, Paul came upon some disciples of John who were already baptized. They were baptized under John's baptism, but that baptism was an outdated baptism. There was new revelation, the baptism of the name of Jesus. And of course, when Paul shared this with them, those 12 disciples of John were baptized all over again in the name of Jesus. Baptism is necessary for salvation, and this is a basic fundamental truth of the word of God. Uh, laying on of hands, which has to do with receiving the Holy Ghost. Uh, resurrection of the dead, the fact that there is coming a day in which everyone who has ever lived, uh, everyone who has ever been born, lived and died, will be resurrected to stand before God. For those of us that are in the church, that are saved, that are holy, uh, we are looking for our resurrection to be the rapture of the church. When the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, he raptures his church out of here. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then 1,000 years later, the, the, uh, the rest of humanity that did not come up in the first resurrection Everyone else will come up in the second resurrection and stand before God and his great white throne of judgment to be judged according to their works. This is a basic fundamental truth because what does the resurrection of the dead communicate to us? It communicates to us that there is more to life than just this life. It communicates to us that this life is just, as I heard one person say, a dressing room, a waiting room for the life that is to come, which is eternity. You have to spend forever somewhere. And that's what the resurrection, the teaching of the resurrection of the dead instructs us. It is a basic fundamental truth to know that there is more, there's something beyond this life. Perhaps it wouldn't be so bad if a person just lived and died and then that's it. But that's not the way it is. 
that how we live this life will determine how we, where we spend the life that is to come. And it is not enough to just be a good person. You've got to be like Jesus. Uh, and then finally, the last principle, eternal judgment, which uh, goes hand in hand with the resurrection of the dead, that there is judgment to come. God is going to judge every man. Every man will be judged according to his work shall be. For those of us who make the rapture, our judgment will be as to what rewards we will receive that we would enjoy throughout eternity. But for everyone else that comes up at the, the, the uh, great white throne of judgment and the second resurrection uh, that will be judged and counted wicked and ungodly, they will be cast into hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and a lake of fire that burneth with fire and brimstone. This is a basic fundamental truth of the word of God. Understanding these things understanding these principles coming into the knowledge of these truths and embracing them understanding them and applying them to your life uh, you've applied the principles you've applied the basics you've lived them out you believe them now you can build on that and leave the basics and go on unto perfection and what is perfection again perfection is full spiritual maturity perfection in the scriptures uh, contrary to popular belief does not mean that a person is infallible and capable of making mistakes for as long as we are in these fleshly carnal bodies we will be susceptible to making mistakes but, uh, it, but as we live this life we are striving to go on to perfection which simply means we are looking to, uh, to live out everything that God has revealed to us as right everything that he has commanded us to do we are doing it if you are doing everything that God has revealed to you to do that is right and staying away from everything that you know that is wrong then you are living perfect or in other words you are living complete or you are living entirely in accordance with the revelation that you have received even if you fall you can you still do what is right what you know to do that is right to get yourself back up and this is the biblical definition of perfection, full spiritual maturity, completeness, wholeness, entire in accordance, entirely in accordance to what God's word has revealed unto you. Can we say amen? This is the pursuit of every Christian. And he says in verse number three, this will we do. If God permit, what will we do? We would leave the principles and go on unto perfection. Now we have been make, trying to make the case time, over and over again over these last six lessons uh, what perfection is, how to accomplish it, our standard of perfection, which is Jesus, how it is achieved. It, we, it is done through teaching. It comes by way of suffering. It comes through going through. It comes through allowing God to work on us. It comes through daily surrender to his word. It comes through a surrender to the corrective element that is in the church of God. It comes through being a sheep and not a wolf. This is how God takes the individual onto full spiritual maturity. Now, uh, for our, uh, final lesson on tonight, I want to look at the four um, classifications of the Christian uh, during the life cycle of spiritual development. There are four classifications, four stages, if you will, based on uh, your spiritual development. Now, remember, in the first lesson, uh, we talked about being a full age. And being a full age, that is being a mature Christian, that does not have anything to do with the number of years that you've been saved. To suggest that because I have been saved 20 years, that I am a mature Christian, I am of full age. No, full age is a relative term, meaning that whatever God has revealed to you within the time frame that you have been saved, and that if you are living that out, you are of full age. That is, uh, if, if, for example, uh, you have the knowledge that a, let's say you've been saved for five years. God, whatever God has revealed to you within that five-year time frame, you're living that out, you're of, you are of full age because you are living in accordance with the knowledge of a five-year-old saint. It's like a kindergartner. A, a child that goes to kindergarten, by the end of kindergarten, 
they are expected that they would have the knowledge consistent with what is given during the kindergarten grade or the sixth grade or the 12th grade. And so full age is relative to the number of years of the, that you have been saved and that the level of truth that God has revealed to you, what you have been taught during that time frame, living in accordance with that, putting it to work and putting it to use in your life, you are of full age. Uh, and this is what God expects of us. Now, during that time, of that lifespan of development, there are primarily four stages that the scripture teaches uh, with respect to where you are in your walk with God. I'm going to give you those four stages, and then we're going to go over them, and it shouldn't take us but about 30 minutes. Number one, a babe. These are Bible words that describes the stage of the life cycle or the spiritual development of the believer. A babe. Number two, a disciple. Number three, a servant. And number four, a friend. The friend of God. Now, let's look at B. Let's go to first. Peter chapter 2, verse number 2, very familiar passage of scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, and verses number 1 and 2. All right. God saved us. At some point, we moved from unbelief to faith. At some point, we moved from unbelief to faith. For this is how God saved us. We had to have some faith in the word that was preached unto us. Before that, we had unbelief. And God could, can't do anything with a person who is steeped in unbelief. But at some point, the word of God was preached to us and we moved from faith or from unbelief to faith. And now that we are saved, that faith that we had has to continue to grow. It has to continue to be developed. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, uh, hearing the word of God. That faith has to continue to grow. It has to continue to develop. And the only way that it can happen as a babe in Christ is through the word of God. Now, what is a babe? A babe is one that is a newborn, that is newly saved. A babe is one that doesn't know anything. A babe is one that cannot take care of itself. You think of it in terms of a baby. What can a baby teach himself? What, what can a baby teach himself? He can't teach himself anything. What can a baby do for itself? Can, can the baby make its own bottle? Can the baby uh, cook its own food? Can the baby change its own diaper? No. The baby cannot do anything for himself, for itself. It must be taken care of. And as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. It doesn't matter how old you are in terms of your natural years, whenever God saves you, you are a babe in Christ. Because a babe doesn't know anything. And it's not a disrespect to say that you are a babe in Christ uh, because babes, and we'll show you here momentarily, that babes get revelation from God. And so it's not a disrespect it is a term that describes where you are on your journey to spiritual development and your understanding and re of revelation and the truth that has been revealed to you. And so what is the responsibility of one that is a babe? Verse, uh, First Peter chapter number two and verses number one and two. If we have it, can we say amen? All right. Uh, let us read. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may develop 
that ye may grow, that ye may develop by the word that you receive or the word that you desire. Now, first he says, laying aside all malice because when God saves you, you've got to lay aside every ill, negative, wicked, and ungodly feeling that you had before he saved you. You've got to lay that aside now. Malice, jealousy, envy. Lay aside all guile, which is deceit, evil speaking. Lay aside hypocrisies, which is uh, pretending to be one thing uh, and concealing and hiding what you really are. Uh, all envies, that is uh, desiring what other people have, to take what they have. Wanting someone else's wife, wanting someone else's husband. These are envies and laying aside all evil speakings. When you come into the church, you may have done that out in the world, but now that you're in the church, you have to lay that aside now. You have to put that, leave that in the world where you found it. And as you drop those behaviors and attitudes and uh, 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 ideas and ideological thinking, uh, evil speakings, as you lay aside these emotions that do not produce godliness, simultaneously as newborn babes, you are to desire, we are to desire the sincere milk of the word. Now, a baby needs milk, does it not? Uh, he may nurse from his mother's breast, or he may uh, be given, uh, what is it, Similac? Formula, thank you. Uh, either way, a baby needs milk in order to develop. Uh, a baby, you may say, well, steak tastes better than milk. Well, a baby can't consume steak. A baby can't chew. He, can only, she can, he or she can only suck. And as newborn babes in the spiritual, there are some things about God's word that babes cannot consume yet. Uh, you try feeding a baby a piece of steak, it'll choke them. Well, there's some steak in the word of God. And if you try to give a babe in Christ that steak, you may choke them to death. What do they need? What does a babe need? A babe needs milk. And what is the milk? The milk is the basic fundamental truths, the basics of God's word. That's what the milk is. Now, the word of God is likened under three things in the scriptures. Here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it is likened unto milk. It is milk for the babe in Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, verse number 4, it is likened unto bread. Uh, uh, not 4, verse 4, but uh, in Matthew chapter number uh, six in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, "Give us this day our daily bread." Um, well, yeah, Matthew chapter four, verse four, Jesus said, "Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God." So it is likened unto milk for the babe, bread for your daily consumption, and in Hebrews chapter number five, strong meat. Now, if milk is the basics. And bread is our daily consumption, just the reading of the Bible. Then strong meat are is the deep things of God's word, the deep things, uh, the seven days of creation, the seven feasts of Jehovah, the Book of Revelation, uh, eschatologies, uh, soteriology, Christology. All of these, or Christology, maybe not, but all of these subjects are the deep things of God's word. And it takes time to get to that point. You don't get there overnight. I was talking to um, uh, one minister on Sunday. Uh, oh, it actually, was it when I was down in Jackson? And he was sharing with me that when um, Bishop Combs, he was just a young pastor, uh, pastoring five years in. And uh, Bishop Paddock mentored him. And Bishop Paddock asked him, well, so what are you teaching in Bible class right now? And uh, Bishop Collins, he was Elder Collins at the time, uh, said, uh, I'm teaching uh, seven days of creation. And Bishop Paddock said, what? You can't teach that to them right now. They will, that will choke them. You'll kill your church. They are just babes. You have to give them milk. They're not ready for that yet. And this is how it is in the life, in the life cycle of the child of God. The pastor 
must know what the, what the saint needs, when the saint needs it, and how the saint needs it. Because if you give deep things too soon, you can choke somebody. Uh, the, the Bible says, and Jesus said in the book of Matthew, to give them meat in due season. That is meat when it is necessary, when the time is right. And so as newborn babes, in that developmental stage, as a babe in Christ, what the babe needs is milk. Now, the delivery of the milk is the responsibility of the pastor. But the desire for the milk is the responsibility of the saint. It is your responsibility, it's my responsibility to have a desire for the word of God. Now, when you got saved, when you first got saved, you didn't necessarily have that desire. When you first got saved, you didn't know what you didn't know. You didn't love what you, what you uh, uh, didn't know you were supposed to love. And so when you first got saved, you didn't have that desire. But as you came to Bible study and you tasted the milk, you realize, oh, this is what I need. You realize, number one, this tastes pretty good. Anytime you have heard something out of God's word that you did not know before, you've realized just how much you needed it. Anytime your eyes have been open to see something in the scriptures through teaching that you didn't see before, you didn't realize it then, but you know it now, you need it. And what happens is, is that when you taste something good, you want some more of it. <laughs> when you taste something good, you, ha you develop a hunger for it. And this is how it is as a babe. That's why the babe must show up to church. That's why the babe must be present when the word of God is going for, so that as God is teaching you, he is simultaneously feeding your desire and developing your desire for the word of God. Can we say amen? Uh, uh, do you remember how it was when you first got saved? You wanted to get to every, every church service. Every time the doors were open. Every time Bible study was, uh, was going on, you were there with your Bible and your notepad. Well, why is it that the longer someone is saved, the less of a desire for the word of God that they have? Why is that? You know, well, um, I guess a multitude of reasons, but perhaps what Jesus said in, in uh, Revelation chapter number two, that thou hast left thy first love, you need to go back and repent and go back and do the first works. Maybe we stop doing what we were doing in the beginning. We stopped having the, the attitude of excitement about receiving God's word. Perhaps it's through the cares of this life. We have to be careful with the cares of this life, brothers and sisters, being so busy with the things that appertain unto this life because if we're not careful, Jesus said that it will choke the word of God out of us. And not only will it choke the word of God out of us, but it will choke the desire for the word of God out of us. The longer you're saved, the more of God's word you ought to know, want to know, and love. Can we say amen? I can't get enough of God's word. I'm always learning something. I'm always listening to my favorite teachers. Not you two. <laughs> I'm always listening to my favorite apostolic teachers. I need to start being more clear about that. Uh, I'm always listening to my favorite fathers of the apostolic fathers, learning something, seeing something that I didn't see before. You can look at a scripture a thousand times and that thousand and first time God open up your eye or you hear some teaching on it and you say, you know, I have never seen that before. But it's been there the whole time. Like my father says, it's been in the Bible the whole time. <laughs> you know, that's because God, that's how God works. He gives you revelation. Revelation doesn't happen all at once. It happens in layers as you grow and develop. So the longer you say, the more you're supposed to love God's word. Well, it starts as a babe. If you don't like it as a babe, chances are you won't last very long. Why is the church today like revolving doors 
because babes are not desiring the sincere milk of the word of God. And as a result, they are not developing. They're not growing. Why, why are there so many immature Christians in the church? Because as newborn babes, they did not desire the sincere milk of the word of God, and they have not grown. They have not developed. You should be more developed than what you were last year. Amen, lights. You should be more developed than what you were six months ago. With all this word we getting around here, Bible class twice a week. <laughs> Most churches only have Bible class once a week. We have it twice a week. So you getting double for your trouble. Can we say amen? Somebody said, well, it's no, it's no trouble. Well, it's, that's just an expression. You know, uh, you're getting double. You're getting a double blessing, a double portion. And the more of God's word you receive, the more you should apply. And the more you apply, the more you should be developed. Can we say amen? The problem is, is that we're not developing because we don't desire as we should. And I say we, I'm not talking about any specific person. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Let's go to Matthew chapter number um, 11 and verse number 25. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 25. You see, if your emotions are unstable, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 33 that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. What are your times? Your times are the days in which you live. Uh, the our times is our life is our life wisdom and knowledge the wisdom of God the knowledge of God's word shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation in other words God's word will keep your mind stable God's word will bring your emotions into balance God's word will be the strength that you need in order to stay saved. God's word, his wisdom and his knowledge. How do we get it? Comes by way of the New Testament pastor through instruction. And so if you are, feel like your life is all over the place, your emotions are all, all over the place, as a child of God, you've got to get the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. You've got to get the word of God. Put it to practice. Talk back to yourself with the script. I talk back to myself with the scriptures all the time. All the time. I challenge myself with the word of God all the time. I use the scriptures on myself. Praise the Lord. And if you want to be stable, use the scriptures on yourself. If you want to be strong, use the word of God on yourself. All right, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 25. Let's read. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Lord, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Verse 26. Even so, Father... For so it seemed good in thy sight. Uh, I was teaching a class uh, at the Purpose Institute, and there was a young man there in the class who thought he knew so much about God's word, uh, but uh, he didn't. He didn't know anything. And he, and one, he was so arrogant, so haughty, that whenever he would stand up to speak, the rest of the students would just roll their eyes. Now, I always listen to whatever he had to say, uh, but one, one class I was saying that, you know, I was asking everyone how long they'd been saved. He had just gotten saved, but yet he know everything. Uh, so I was making the point, well, we've got all kinds of, uh, we've got everybody on the developmental spectrum in here. You've got saints that have been saved in here for 25 years, and then you've got babes in Christ pointed to the young man. Now, I didn't mean, I wasn't trying to be offensive. I was just noting what he was. Well, he got mad about that. 
Say, can I see you after class? Yeah. I, I was offended because you called me a babe in Christ. I said, well, how long have you been saved? Six months. Said, well, that's what you are. You are a babe in Christ. Well, I don't like that term. Well, I mean, that's the Bible term for it. But then I took him to this scripture and told him and showed him that babes are in a privileged position. They are in a position that the wise and the prudent of this world are not in. And that is, babes, get revelation. He says, thou hast, Jesus says, thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes, or as Bishop James Johnson called them, little people in the faith. That is, there are things that the babe in Christ gets access to there's knowledge that the babe in Christ gets access to that the wisest in this world don't know Elon Musk Jeff Bezos Bill Gates uh, all of these that are wise in the wisdom of this world and, and they have the wisdom of man they have the mind of man they have the wisdom of man, but they do not know anything about God. They don't know anything about his word. Why? Because they are not in the position to get revelation. But babes in Christ are in position to get revelation and learn something about God. So you're in the position, but what's stopping you from from receiving revelation is that you don't desire the sincere milk of his word because even the basic fundamental truth even that is revelation can we say amen oh yeah somebody said i'm tired of the basic the basics that's revelation too because not everybody has that knowledge uh verse number 26 jesus says for even so father for so it seemed good in thy sight. It pleases God when we get a revelation of his word. It pleases God. It is good in his sight for us to know. Let us go now to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number uh, 14. I could spend all Bible class on this, but we, um, I'm, I'm running out of time here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. Ain't no shame in being a babe. But the shame is in not developing out of that stage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14. Let us read. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. What is the natural man? The natural man is the unsaved, the unregenerated man. The wise and the prudent. That's another way that Jesus said it another way. He said the wise and the prudent. Paul says the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. For they are what? Foolishness unto him. Neither can he understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They don't have the means to understand. They don't have the mechanism, the internal mechanism that opens the eyes of their understanding to receive and understand the things of the Spirit of God. In other words, they don't have the, the Holy Ghost. And in order to understand the things of the Spirit of God, you must have the Spirit of God. Verse, let's jump up to verse number uh, 10 and uh, 11. This is, the, this is the scripture I really wanted. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. What, what is the uh, them? The, the them is what he references in verse number 9. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Nobody knows except the fact that God has revealed them unto us, how? By his spirit. 
So without his spirit, you cannot know. It is an impossibility to know. You can go to seminary. You can go to Bible school. You can go to Liberty University, Cornerstone University. You can uh, do your work at Oral Roberts University, where, uh, where I went. Uh, you can go to these institutions of higher learning, but you cannot learn God at the institutions of higher learning. God has to reveal them unto you by his spirit. And in order to get the revelation by his spirit, you've got to have his spirit. Why? For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Not you. The spirit searcheth all things. So without the spirit, I can't understand no matter how much searching I do. But with the spirit, I don't have to do the searching. The spirit of God does the searching. The spirit of God does the revealing. And how does he do it? He does it through instruction. Verse number 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Oh yes, Elon Musk knows all about how to make money. Jeff Bezos, they know all about because these are the things of the spirit of man and they know it because they have the spirit of a man. What man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God, in the same way, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. That is no man without the spirit of God can know the things of God. So when you are as a babe in Christ, you are in the position because you have the spirit of God to know the things of God. For so it seemed good to the father. It pleases him when we, are, when we get revelation. That's the developmental stage of being a babe. Immature, but God wants to mature you through teaching. Emotions destabilize, God wants to stabilize you through instruction. Don't know anything, he wants to handle that. He wants to give you some knowledge, give you some revelation of himself. So if you're in Bible study, all of us that are in Bible study tonight, you are in a blessed position. Can we say amen? Oh, yes, you are. Let's look at a disciple. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. And verses number 28 through 30. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner, a follower, a student. And you cannot become a disciple, a learner, a follower, a student until you have first desired that word you have made it possible for that word to be fed to you. And then based on the word of God that has been fed, instructed, and planted in your heart by way of teaching, then you put it to use in your life. You follow after it. You hunger and thirst after righteousness. You do as Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now let's read that in Matthew chapter 20, 11, verses number 28 through uh, and 29. If we have it, can we say amen? Almost finished tonight. All right, let us read. Come unto me, some. All. Oh, this is the indiscriminate call of Jesus to everyone. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is the call to salvation. This is what the gospel does. It calls all that labor. Not labor out there working, but being under control of sin. Uh, that are weary. Their soul is weary. Their soul is thirsty like we preached on Sunday. Uh, that, well, I preached that, he preached that here a few weeks ago. Uh, preached it on, in Jackson on Sunday. The soul is thirsty. As the heart panteth after the water brook, David said. Panting because... You've been running and you've got no refreshment, no replenishment. That's how it was when we were in sin. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is the, the indiscriminate call to salvation through the preaching of the gospel. And Jesus says, and I will give you rest. The rest, what is the rest? This is the rest 
uh, wherewith he may cause the weary to rest according to the book of Isaiah and this is the refreshing I want you to know that that is the baptism of the Holy Ghost so verse number 28 is the call the first part is the call to salvation and when we answer the call to salvation God says I will give you rest in other words I will give you the Holy Ghost verse number 29 take my yoke upon you and do what so now that I have the Holy Ghost, now I've got to get connected with Jesus. I've got to connect with his system and learn of him. How do I learn of him? I learn of him through my connection with his system and I learn of him by way of how he teaches and that is through the New Testament ministry. In other words, I become a disciple after I learn of him. As I learn of him, I put it into work, I put it into use, I apply it to my life, I follow after that, thereby making me a disciple. A disciple is a learner. It is, it, a disciple is a student. And what does a student do? Well, a good student learns. <laughs> a bad student skips class. <laughs> and, we, and like we learned when we were in school, when you skip class, you don't get credit. Uh, and if you don't get enough credit, you can't go to the next level. Well, when you skip Bible class, you don't get credit. And if you don't get enough credit, you can't go to the next level. You can't go to heaven. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you and do what? Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That is the, his character, so that now that I am a disciple and I learn of him, his character now can become my character and ye shall find rest unto your souls that is the rapture of the church and so you see the life cycle of the child of God in these verses come unto me the gospel is preached we answer the call he gives us rest we get connected with him he teaches us, we learn, we are disciple of him, we take on his character, and ultimately we shall find rest for our souls. That's the rapture of the church. That's how it is, brothers and sisters, as a disciple. Let's go now to uh, Luke chapter number 14 and verses number 26 through 33. Luke chapter 14. Oh, yes, this is a goodie. Tell somebody, this is a goodie. <laughs> Luke chapter 14 and verses number 26 through 33. All right. Well, let's pick it up in verse 25. And there went a great multitude, uh, there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. Look at this. He cannot be my follower, my student, my disciple. Now, he is not saying that if you're going to follow him, that you can't have a relationship with your father and mother, that you have to hate them. I hate you. I love Jesus and I hate you. No, that's not what he is saying at all. What he is saying is that these relationships have to be in a secondary position to him if you are going to be his disciple. Even your own life, even your own desires, ambitions, pursuits, goals, they all have to be in a secondary position he has to be of primary importance. Now that cuts close because for many people, their problem is relationships. Their problem uh, is, the, is the relationship that they connected to to validate them, to give them purpose, to give their lives meaning. Jesus says, if any of these are more important than me, you cannot be my disciple. Because what is a disciple? If a disciple is a follower, that means that he is saying, I cannot lead you if somebody else is in front of you. Lord have mercy. Cuts close, doesn't it? Doesn't mean that I don't love 
It just means that I love him more. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know I, I love my wife. My wife loves me. But if you ask her, she'll tell you she loves him than she loves me uh, more than she loves me. Because if I tell her to do wrong, she's not going to listen to me. She's going to listen to him. Because she loves him more than she loves me. We don't need you to add all that. She's saying, Lord have mercy, way more. Let me, you, you, you down here, he's, uh, well, we don't need you to add all that. Let me teach the Bible. <laughs> she's a good help me. She's not wrong. No, she's not wrong. <laughs> Secondary position, otherwise we cannot be his disciple. Verse number 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be. Look at these conditions he's putting on discipleship. Bearing the cross, the cross is symbolic of suffering. If I'm not willing to suffer for him, then I can't be his disciple. Why is that? Well, number one, he didn't allow any relate, natural relationship that he had to come in between us and him. He, the Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before him was the church. He didn't let anything come between him and the church, not even the human will to not want to be separated from God. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. Even the will of the, the humanity, he didn't even allow that to separate him from the prize. And if he could do it, he expects us to do it. Not even to allow the will of our humanity to separate us from him. Not only that, he suffered for us. We can do some suffering for him. We don't have to suffer on his level. But it's going to cost us, discipleship is going to cost us. To be a follower, a student, a learner is going to cost you, it's going to cost you relationships. It may cost you money. But what doth the profit a man that he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what, it, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He'll give everything if his mind is not right. Oh, I just can't live without a woman, so I'm going to give up my soul. Well, that's up to you. You know, that's up to you. I can't live without a man, so I'm just going to go out here and do what I want to do. Well, that's up to you, but you're going to pay for that in the end. There's going to come a time you wish to God I would have listened to the pastor. I think that the greatest torment in hell is not going to be the flames, the fire, and the brimstone. It is going to be being able to look up and see the saints in heaven rejoicing and to know I could have been up there. I had every opportunity. All I had to do was just listen. That's all you got to do. Can we say amen? All I had to do was just listen. But I wanted to do my own thing and look at where it's got me. Lord have mercy. Don't let it be said of you. I'm not going to let it be said of me. There is nothing more important than going to heaven. Well, verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, said it not down first and counted the cost? Yes, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after that he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king said it not down first and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaken not all that he hath he cannot be my desire. In other words, count up the cost and make your decision. Count up the cost. What is it going to cost me? It's going to cost me my, my Tuesday evenings, my Friday evenings. Count up the cost and make your decision. 
It's going to cost me my Wednesday evening. It's going to cost me that man, that girl, that job, that career, in whatever it may cost you. Count up the cost and take care of business. Can we say amen? I like, I was talking to Sister Kayla. I hope she don't mind me sharing this. She probably will mind, but that's all right. <laughs> she said, I took on a second job, and, uh, the, and, and it was encroaching in my church time. I wasn't in Bible class last week, and I just did not want to miss Bible class. So I told my boss, I, look, I have to be in Bible class. And, and the boss said, I'm a pastor. No, you don't. You have to work. I said, that ain't no pastor. Anytime a pastor tells you, you don't need to be in church, that ain't no pastor. <laughs> I said, she said, well, what do I do? Uh, quit. <laughs> don't, you don't give no, you don't need to give no notice. No, you don't need to give no notice. Because he don't even want you to give God notice. He doesn't care anything about the things that, and you know, sometimes, we have to make these decisions. You know, you say, I'm, I need to get six jobs because I got all these bills. Well, <laughs> number one, you, we need to give you Dave Ramsey's course <laughs> on uh, financial management so that you don't have so many bills. But number two, sometimes less is more. I'm working 60, 90, I'm working 160 hours a week. Well, brother, there's only 162 hours in a week. Yeah, I'm working 160 of them. <laughs> and you still and I bet you still falling short, aren't you? I bet you still I bet you still struggling, aren't you? Now you're worse because you're struggling and you're tired. Sometimes you gotta cut back. And in your cutting back for Jesus, he knows how to fill up the difference. So I cut back from 160 hours to 40. And I got, I got more money now. <laughs> what changed? Did your bills change? No, the bills will stay the same. You know, it's just that I put God first. I counted the cost and I, and I handled my business. And when you handle your business, God will handle it. When you handle God's business, God will handle your business. Can we say amen? Take my yoke upon you. When you get connected to him, what is your priority now is his business. <laughs> you know Deacon Marcellus makes me feel good for about 10 seconds during every Bible class because he don't be saying nothing the rest of the Bible class <laughs> but just for that 10 seconds I know I'm teaching <laughs> when you get connected because that's what the yoke is the yoke you put a yoke around oxen and the the big the old oxen would carry you don't hook a young ox to a big to a full grown ox because the bull, the full grown ox would pull the young ox and would choke the young young ox and so that's why he was saying in the New Testament uh, be not unequally yoked together uh, don't be connected to the wrong people but when you get connected with Jesus your load becomes his load your concern becomes his concern. Your priorities become his priorities. My pro his priorities are mine and mine are his. That's what a real relationship is. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. His priorities become mine. My become his. And that's what a real relationship is. <laughs> God knows how to take care of you. And so count up the cost. Lord, I need to do this, but I don't want to miss church. But you know I got these bills. I'm going to put this in your hand. I, this is, I keep telling you this. This is what you got to do. I'm going to tell you how to make it through. I'm going to tell you how to get your mind together. I'm going to tell you how to alleviate worry and to reduce the cortisol that's flowing through your bloodstream and keeping you stressed. I'm going to tell you how. Lord, I'm putting this in your hand. You, you got to say this. I'm putting this in your hands and I'm not going to worry about it. This is yours. I'm not going to worry about it. I trust you. You know what's best for me. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> if you do that, you're not going to trip. 
because you have to, because God because as, as a matter of fact that's what God wants casting all your care upon him for he cared for you he cared for us that's what he wants he wants all of your cares he wants everything that you're tripping about he wants you to stop tripping can we say amen tell somebody stop tripping <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I'm gonna stop tripping too. You know, because I get tempted to trip, but I put my cares in God's hands and He takes care of it. Count up the cost and handle your business and follow Jesus and don't let anything come between you and Him. All right? Uh, that's the disciple. Now, when you learn of Him, now I've got information that I need so that I can effectively serve him. Let's go to St. Uh, here's the scripture I wanted. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, this, is a, this is too long. That's the parable of the ten talents. It's uh, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14 through 30, but we don't have time to read all of that. We better read. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses number 22 through 24. This is the next stage. I'm a servant. I'm a servant now. What is a servant? A servant is a bondman. It is a prisoner. It is one who does the will of another. How, do I, how can I do his will if I don't know his will? Well, I've got to be taught his will as a disciple. How can I be taught if I don't desire to be taught? Well, I have to desire the sincere milk as a babe so as I desire the word of God as a babe I'm taught it as a disciple I'm taught I learn and I follow after him and as I learn and I'm taught I now have knowledge of his will his purpose and his plan now I can serve him based on what I know about him. And this is the next stage, which is a servant. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 22 through 24. Let us read. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Now, these are two terms, two words that appear to be paradoxical or oxymorons, or contradict one another. Servant and free man. Servant is a, is a prisoner, a bondman. Uh, the Apostle Peter in uh, St. Peter chapter number 1, Saint first, Second Peter chapter number 1, identified himself. He said, Peter, a servant and an apostle. The word servant in that text means a love slave. So how can I be both a servant, a prisoner, a bondman, a love slave, but also the Lord's free man? Well, it depends on who you're serving. Because when we were in the world, according to the book of Romans, we were the servants of sin. We were under sin's control. We were slaves to sin. We did whatever sin told us to do. Sin said, smoke this, we smoked it. Drink this, we drank it. Go here, we went there. But being made free from sin, he says, ye have become the servants to righteousness. In other words, when God saved us, he set us free from slavery. But in him setting us free, we are not masterless. We traded a bad master for a good master. 
And now we are the servants of God and we yield our members to serve righteousness. So he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. That is, we have been called to the waters of baptism. We have been called to salvation. He has saved us. We have been called to the feast. We've been called to the dinner table, which is Bible class. And as, the, as we are the Lord's free man, he set us free from sin. We now are in a position to become a servant. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So how do we serve as the Lord's free man? We serve in the church. We serve in the local assembly. We serve based on the knowledge of God that we have. Now, why is that so important? Because the why of your service matters, just it matters more than what you are actually doing. The why you're doing it matters more than the what you're than what you're doing. Why am I singing in the choir? Because I want to be heard, you need more word. I got bars tonight, as the kids say. I got bars. <laughs> you want to be, if, you, if you're doing it for a self-serving purpose, then you need more word in you. You need the word of God to drive that out of you. If you're doing it because you want somebody to hear you, and validate you and say good things about you, then you are a men pleaser and you need more word to drive that out of you. You need to be free from that so that you can be Christ's servant. Whoever you are trying to please, that's who you are serving. You need to be free so that you can serve Christ. Verse number 23, ye are bought with a price be not ye. In other words, who paid for me? I was on the auction block of life, being traded from one sinner to the next until Jesus showed up at the auction, preached the gospel to me, saved my life, paid for my life with blood. And now I have been bought with a price. The price that he paid was his blood. And now I belong to him and he belongs to me. So ye are bought with a price. He purchased your salvation through his shed blood. Therefore, be ye not servants of men. Don't go around talking about uh, I'm, I'm singing to make you happy. I'm singing, I'm serving I want the pastor to see me. You don't serve the pastor. You serve God. Can we say amen? amen? You may serve at the pleasure of the pastor or whatever authority you have comes from the pastor, just like I serve at the pleasure of the diocesan bishop, whatever authority I have comes from the diocesan bishop, but I don't serve the diocesan. I serve God. I serve the bishop of my soul, which is Jesus. We, we can't lose sight of that, brothers and sisters, because if you serve the pastor, then when the pastor smiles, you're feeling good. If he frowns, you're wondering, did you do something wrong? And sometimes the pastor's feeling good, sometimes he's not. And when the pastor's up, you up, down, and you're watching for how the pastor's looking so that you can know how you're supposed to feel. Oh, no, you're too, you're, you're too wrapped up in personality you got to get wrapped up in Jesus because the pastor didn't buy you. You are on loan from God. <laughs> you know, ye, be ye not the servants of men. I've shared with you my testimony when I was learning how to play the keyboard and I was pecking one finger at a time and the church was small, barely had a church. It was just my father and my mother and us four children. And I was in the corner trying to learn how to play the keyboard. And one drive home, my mother and my father were in the front seat and they were laughing. Now they weren't making fun of me. They were probably laughing to keep from crying because wasn't nobody coming to church. <laughs> and we were driving two hours to get here just to look at each other. We could have did this two hours ago back at home. 
we were looking at each other at home. Why we got to come to Bay City to look at each other? You know? <laughs> and so they were making fun of me, playing the keyboard, one finger. Philip over there, he don't know what he's doing. Ha, 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 ha. Well, that hurt my feelings sitting in the back seat. Brother Jeff, hurt my feelings. I went home and I cried. I put my face in the pillow and cried. <laughs> my feelings were hurt. I went to my father and said, y'all hurt my feelings. I was only 14 years old at the time. He said, what do we do? I said, y'all were making, you and mom were making fun of me playing the keyboard. I'm over here, I'm trying to play, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to play for you, and y'all making fun of me. My father had zero sympathy on me. <laughs> he said, you don't play for me. You th I thought you were supposed to be playing for Jesus. You don't play for me, you play for God. He told me that at 14 years old. I never forgot that lesson. And that fixed me right up from that day forward. From that day forward, I didn't care how I sounded, as long as I sounded good to Jesus. <laughs> What's the point? I didn't serve the pastor. I served under the pastor. I served with the authority that the pastor gave me, but the motive of my service was all about him. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Wherever God has set you in the church, serve. Do it to the best of your ability because you belong to him. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm out of time. We need to get to the last one, which is a friend. Now that I'm serving him, I'm getting close to him. I'm doing his will, and there's only one more position for me to be in, and that is to be his friend. Let's go to uh, James chapter 2 and verse number 23. Book of James chapter 2. And verse number 23. That's all we, that's all we want there. Then we're going to go to St. John chapter 15 and verse 15, and then we'll have to close. James chapter 2, verse number 23. Serving him, doing his will from the heart, striving to please him, living right, all of what he has revealed to me. I'm talking about going on to perfection. All that he's revealed to me, living right. God looks at me and says, you know what, you're my friend. You are my friend. What is a friend? A friend is a close associate, an elevated position. Proverbs 18 24 uh, says that a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Then it says, but there is a friend that is taken closer than a brother. Let's, we'll read that here before we leave so I can get the right understanding of it. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, uh huh, and it was counted to him for righteousness, yes, and he was called the friend of God. Why was he called the friend of God? Because he believed God. That faith that he had was put into action. When, he, when God said, offer your son, Abraham said, okay. He staggered not at the promises of God. All of the promises that God made Abraham, he didn't question it. He, did, he heard the gospel preached. The gospel was good news that I'm going to bless you. He believed it. He walked according to it. He waited patiently for the promise, 25 years for the promise to come to pass, the promised child, Isaac. During that 25 years, he did not question God. He believed it. He stood on it. And as a result, righteousness was accounted to him. God said, you are righteous. That's what imputation is. He looked at his faith, looked at his works, and said, you are righteous. And because of what Abraham did, he had no frame of reference. He had no Bible to read. He had no testimonies to recall. 
He had no good anecdotal stories of anyone's experiences with God that led him to saying, you know what, I'm going to try him for myself. No. God came to him. God spoke to him. Abraham believed it, lived his life according to it. It was imputed for him to righteousness. And God said, you know what, that's what being my friend looks like. Being my friend looks like believing my word, living it, serving me, not questioning me. That's what being my friend looks like. And if Abraham could do it because he was the father of our faith, that means that we can do it. Can we say amen? Ye are the children of Abraham, and the works of Abraham shall ye do. That's what the scripture says. If ye be the children of Abraham, which all of us are the children of Abraham by faith through Jesus Christ. And so, if ye are the children of Abraham, the works of Abraham ye shall do. And the works that Abraham did was that he believed God, and he allowed that faith to propel him into a position of being a friend of God. God revealed his secrets to Abraham because God reveals his secrets to his friends. Let's go to St. John chapter number 15 and verse number 15. St. John chapter 15. You walk so close to God where he reveals his secrets to you. Oh, yes, you can. Moses did. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. God said, you can't see my face and live. But he said, there's a place beside me. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover your face, and I'll make all of my goodness to pass before you. And as I pass before you, I'll uncover your face and let you see my back parts. That's what he did for Moses, and he declared the name of the Lord to Moses. You know what that was? Well, the goodness that he made pass before him was all of time. The, the seven days of creation that Moses wrote about in Genesis chapter number one. He saw that when God showed it to him. And he said, I'll let you see my back parts. The back parts of, of God is what was to come behind, and that was him coming as a man. And he declared the name of the Lord. Somebody said, it was I am that I am. It was uh, Jehovah. No, Moses had already had that name. The name of the Lord that was declared was the name Jesus. Moses heard the name Jesus uh, because that was always God's name from the very beginning. It was just a secret. But he revealed it to Moses because Moses was his friend. Can we say amen? Do you know the name of Jesus? The greatest name? You know why? Because you're in a position to receive it. Do you have revelation? Truth? Knowledge? You know why? Because you're in a position to receive it. Now walk according to it so that you can be the friend of God too. Verse number 15 of St. John chapter 15. He is saying here to his disciples, henceforth, or from this point forward, I call you not servants. Why, Jesus? For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. This is a position for us to be in. To get revelation from God. If God has given you revelation, that means he's putting you in that position. Now, don't lose the position. Can we say amen? amen? Stay in the position so that you can continue to learn more of him because he is making himself known to us through his word. Some people receive, some people hear it and they leave. You know why? Because they ain't no friend of God. Some people hear it and they get mad. Some people receive the word of God, they hear the word of truth, they're taught it, they're getting mad because they don't want to be held accountable to it. Only thing I can say is you must not be a friend of God because a friend of God does not run from truth, it runs with the truth. And as the old says, you say, I'm going to run on and see what the end is going to be. Let's go to Proverbs 18, 24, this is our last scripture. Since I just quoted it, may as well read it. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24. Mm -hmm. 
let me give you the right understanding of this verse and then we will close. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, if we have it, can we say amen? amen. All right, this is our last verse of scripture. Then we close. I know you're tired. You've been working for the last hour and a half. I've been doing all the work. <laughs> all right, let's read. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, the word friendly in this verse is, has a negative connotation. You think the verse just says if you want to be, if you want to have friends, you got to be friendly, right? That's what you think it means. That's not what it means. I mean, you can say that's what it means in practical application, but in etymology, that's not what it means. A man that has friends must adjust his personality to those friends. Another version reads it like this. A man of many companions will come to ruin. A man of many friends will come to ruin. Why? Because he has to adjust himself to keep those so-called friends. Uh, one version says, there are friends who pretend to be friends and you come to ruin thereby. So the correct understanding of this verse is that, let me give you a companion verse for it, evil communication corrupts good manners. A man that has friends, a man of many friends, must adjust himself to keep those friends, good or bad. And most of the time it'll be bad. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That friend that sticketh closer than a brother, that's God. Because you don't have to make any negative adjustments to keep him. He, if, if he is your friend, he adjusts you so, that you so that he can stay in your life. And so people say, uh, if you want to have friends, just, just show yourself friendly. You got to be careful with that. Because some friends will have you up, some friends will have you down. We tell our young people, you can't be everybody's friend because of their evil influences. Come on, smoke this with me. No, I don't smoke. I thought you was my friend. Come on, we're friends. Well, no real friend is going to try to entice you to do wrong. I think the scripture says, my son, if sinners, thank you very much. I was just uh, looking for it. And if, if sinners entice you to do evil, what are you supposed to do? Consent thou not. Consent thou not. Don't let them talk you into doing stupid stuff. I'm not trying to be nobody's friend. I want to be God's friend. Because I found out that he is a friend that'll stick closer than any brother. He is a friend that'll stand by you. That's what I want to be in my life cycle of development. I want to be God's friend. How about you? Amen? Amen? All right. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. We are past our time. And we have to close. So we want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for everyone that's here tonight. Thank you to those in our online audience that uh, stuck with us on YouTube, Facebook. God bless you. To our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, we have a few Pakistanis that got up at 4 a.m. to be a part of this Bible class. So, yes, that's what I said. So, a great big God bless you. Khudabka baraka day, yesu masi kename. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's, that's dedication right there. That's real love. Because at 4 a.m., you know what I'm doing? <laughs> I set three alarms. 4.40, 4.45, 5 a.m. Turn the first one off, turn the second one off, turn the third one, I'll go back to sleep. You know, the real alarm wakes me up. The real alarm is my wife telling me to stop setting so many alarms. 
you know, most of the time in the morning, she's up uh, right before me right at the same time praying. Monday mornings, the whole house be shaking. She down there. Y'all, y'all sisters know that Monday morning prayer call, whole house be shaking. I, was, I went to the gym one morning, came uh, early, came back home, early morning prayer, I'm coming down the street. I'm like, what is that noise? What is that? He got closer to the house. I said, oh my God, that is my wife praying. <laughs> I said, hallelujah, pray on, sister. Pray on. Well, God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. We thank you for making your way out to the house of the Lord and uh, pressing your way to this live stream. We hope and pray that you were blessed by the word of the Lord. Uh, at this time, we're prepared to take our offering. And uh, as we do online, we offer you an opportunity in our online audience to partner with us in giving. If you uh, so choose to do that, a number of different ways that you can give electronically as the information is on your screen for your convenience. Uh, if you are giving, we certainly do appreciate you. If you have a heart to give but you don't have the means to give, that's all right. Uh, just please keep us in your prayers. Uh, prayer is more valuable than anything. So God bless you. Let me say a great big God bless you to those in our online audience. If you're in the Great Lakes Bay region, Bay City, Saginaw, Midland, somewhere within 35 to 45 mile radius around the church, and you're looking for a church home, uh, perhaps you want to visit our next service, maybe you just want to find out what we believe, visit us on our Next Steps app, exploreelc.com. There you can find all information relative and pertinent to this local assembly, exploreelc.com. Join us on Sunday morning. Uh, at 11 a.m. for our uh, Palm Sunday service. The King is coming. Uh, the King is here. And we're looking forward to celebrating him. Until then, God bless you in Jesus' name. To our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, we love you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention.